Hello all, I'm here with a new video for you today. And today I wanna to talk about the operating system that ushered in a whole new era, Ubuntu 4.10. 20 years this month since Ubuntu 4.10 was released in October of 2004. Now for many of us, 2004 was an era of Lincoln Park, going to the movies with your friends, and you know, just generally coming of age stuff. That's how lots of us remember the early 2000s. But for Merrick Shuttleworth, it was something a little bit different. See, for him, 2004 was an era of vision. Mark Shuttleworth was a South African developer who, in 1995, had founded a company called Thoughte, who went on to be a major player in security certificates even to this day. He later sold this company, or at least his stake in it, for $575 million in 1999. And then, <clears throat> With that money, he went on to form the Mark Shuttleworth Foundation, which gave us Freedom Toasters. If you don't know what Freedom Toasters are, this is a very fun thing that I found when I was going into this video. And what it is, is it's a kiosk, like a vending machine, where you put in your CDs and it burns free software to your free CDs and DVDs. Because, you know, every rich guy with a couple of billion dollars needs to have a foundation named after him with a crazy project. At least this one gives you free software and not bug burgers, so that's a plus. It was about this time that a vision started to form. What if we could take Linux and make it into something more human, more approachable? This is the vision that gave Ubuntu form. But you see, in 2004, Linux, a lot of the pieces were already there for Linux. Like for example, you already had your major desktop environments such as KDE, and GNOME, they were already around. You were already running the long running 2.6 series kernel, but no one had yet really found a way put it all together into one more approachable, more human package. In 2004, Linux was still very much the realm of enthusiasts, let's say. With this idea of making Linux more approachable and more human, Mark Shuttleworth took a icebreaker to Antarctica with six months of Debian mailing lists, and it was there that he sat down and used his prior experience in the Debian project to go through these mailing lists while sitting on an icebreaker and form the team that would develop Ubuntu 4.10. Because while in 2004 a few distros had really taken a hard shot at making Linux more approachable, more easy to use. Distros like Mandriva, for example, no one had really just figured out the way to really put it all together yet. And they definitely didn't figure out a way to put it together like Ubuntu could. Ubuntu took your long running 2.6 series kernel and gave it a easy to use, pretty decent looking interface in the form of GNOME 2, which is still with us today, and put that together with all sorts of other applications like Firefox and OpenOffice to create one package or in one package, a functional and easy to use and just much more friendly Linux operating system. Before Ubuntu, you'd have to do a lot of things. Ubuntu was also the first to come with things like Orca screen reader and stuff like that. Made it a very popular choice for this, for people with accessibility needs. Another huge thing that Ubuntu did, this is probably the biggest, is it had a, it has a very easy to use installer. Ubuntu 4.10 used a Encurse style installer that is very quick, very easy to follow, and pretty radical at the time. It configured X and your network for you because anyone that's ever had to configure X knows just how much it makes you want to beat your head off of a desk. It's incredibly just finicky and fussy and Ubuntu took that process and simplified it in a way that made it automatic and it actually mostly worked. Another huge aspect is that Ubuntu inherited Debian's package management system app and through this it inherited Debian's still to this day famously massive software repositories which gave it easy access to tens and thousands of pieces of software, if not more, probably actually hundreds of thousands. And it put, it gave you access to it in a way that made it all very easy to install and very easy to manage with the apt package management. App package management is so easy to use that you can use one command and you can upgrade your entire system at once. Doesn't mean you always should, but you can. Ubuntu 4.10 is really what set the foundation for the Ubuntu we've seen today and really the kind of direction for Linux as a whole for the next 10 to 15 years. Why did they call it Warty Warthog then? Calling it Warty Warthog was a bit of an in-joke among the devs because all releases, this is just the nature of software development. All first releases have their warts. It's as a software project develops 
and matures that you eventually kind of work out these warts. Any software that you imagine that's ever been released, the first release has wart and they get fixed over time as people use it and people find the bug and there's more work put into it. This is essentially the essence of how software projects mature. 2004, Ubuntu was not very mature yet, but it would get there. It also turns out that besides being a bit of a fun wordplay, the adjective animal name of the same letter actually creates a good naming system. And because of this, and when you take this and you combine it with the month, with the year month versioning system of Ubuntu, you actually get a versioning system that is very easy to recognize and reference releases very quickly. And it, it, it just makes an excellent system. And plus it's a good bit of fun with names like Bionic Beaver or Lucid Lynx or Precise Peglin. Peglin, Peglin. Did I say that right? I don't know, I can't pronounce anything. I also want to take a moment here and interject about fonts. See, a long running complaint about Linux has been about the fonts because one thing that Microsoft does very, very well is rendering fonts and picking fonts. One of the best things that Ubuntu gave to us and really gave back to up to the entire Linux community is that they created an excellent family of fonts that are easy to read on computer screens called the Ubuntu font family. It's a sans serif derivative. It just makes for a very easy, very pleasant reading experience on a screen. And it looks good. What more can you ask for out of a font, right? So by taking everything that had come before, the kernel, the desktop, all of it, the web browser, and putting it together in a much more, frankly, human system that was much more person-centric and easy to use. Because of this, Ubuntu really, really rapidly gained in popularity upon release. Because of this, Canonical had another revolutionary idea right up its sleeve. Some of you might not actually remember this, which is a little weird for me to say, but even back in about 2004, you could just go to like an electronic store and buy a piece of software. All sorts of them were for sale. And the reason for this is, is because dial-up internet was prohibitively slow and multi-gigabyte downloads probably would have tied up your phone line for like a month. Okay, we're talking about 56 kilobyte uh, uh, connections here. And frankly, a lot of the times your computer probably wouldn't even hit the full potential. And on top of that, it would tie up your phone line and no, nobody wanted that. In the early 2000s and really, really rapidly between about 2002 and 2005, this began to change with a very, very rapid rollout of broadband internet. So by about 2004, a lot of people already had DSL internet. And because of this, the cracks in that previous buy it at the store model of uh, business for software was really, there were lots of cracks really starting to show in that kind of business model. I would argue that even to this day, we haven't quite figured out how to monetize software, but back then we really, really did not have it figured out at all. Ubuntu had this idea of a program called Ship It. So for those of you, for those people that already had a reasonably fast broadband connection, they weren't as fast as today, but they were far, far faster than the previous dial-up connections. And the rollout on these broadband connections was very, very fast. Really happened in the course of about three years. You can actually go look up some statistics on different countries, like I was looking at ones for Australia. The rollout was massively fast. Very interesting stuff to read about. But for those that lived out in the countryside or in developing countries, these fa they were stuck with dial-up if they had internet at all. Unless you kind of got lucky, because sometimes sometimes these things can be a little bit weird. Unless you happen to get lucky and lived in one of those villages that's in the middle of nowhere and still somehow had cable, cable or DSL internet, you were stuck with dial-up connections while people in the city had DSL. So, people that lived in the city, they could go on the Ubuntu website and they could download the Ubuntu ISO, which is not that big by modern standards. It's about 500 megabytes, 580 megabytes. And they could download that in a reasonable bit amount of time and burn their own CD and use it that way. But for those of that couldn't, Ubuntu had a special program called Ship It. And what that meant is that you could just go on the Ubuntu website. Okay, it was shipit.ubuntu. You'd put your information in and they would ship you a live CD of Ubuntu for free. Now this program ended in 2011 because they citing administration costs and just the general increase in availability of bandwidth, they felt it wasn't necessary anymore. But at the time, this completely revolutionized how we thought about software as a business model, because before this, you could actually go, at least in some places, you could actually go to the store and buy Linux. See, a common misconception is that the GPL prevents you from selling software. It does not. Okay, you can have a 
piece of software under the GPL and charge for it as much as much as you want. It has nothing to do with that. What it does restrict is it prevents you from restricting the source code aside with the software you're selling. Because of the early internet and the prohibitive, a uh, really slow internet speeds, it was, I wouldn't say common, but there were Linux distributions that were for sale in stores. Mandrake is an example of this. Now, with the rise of Ubuntu, well, you could go to the store and buy Mandrake Linux for 30 or $40, or you could go to the Canonical website and have them mail, ship you a CD for free. I think the choice there becomes rather obvious. And because of this, this made sweeping changes in how we think about software distribution, right down to the fact that now, today, we have the opposite concern with the disappearance of physical media. And thus it was with its shades of brown, which was kind of a part of the Warty Warthog joke, and its radiance light theme, Ubuntu 4.10, ushered in a new era for Linux. So while I've been critical of Canonical in the past, and I continue to be, I say, on this 20th anniversary, why don't we take the time to bury the hatchet and reflect on the good that Canonical has done for us. So don't forget to like and subscribe and pray every day.